1993 presidential address to the Canadian Historical Association, Professor Philip Buckner diagnosed his fellow Canadian historians with myopia. Canadian historians, he blasted, have locked themselves into a, a, into a teleological framework which is obsessed with the evolution of Canadian autonomy and the construction of Canadian national identity and thus downplayed the significance of the imperial experience in shaping the identity of 19th century Canadians. It is time now to put the imperial experience back where it belongs at the center of 19th century Canadian history. Now Buckner could just, a, just as well have been talking about how history was being practiced in, in the British Isles, in the United States, or anywhere else for that matter. Indeed, in the early 90s, the nation state was still the organizing unit of the historical profession. All history departments were organized according to nation states, their undergraduate course offerings, their graduate degree programs, conferences, journals, you name it. And almost all of the production of the profession, lectures, articles, and books, uh, was as a result framed in terms of nation states and national narratives. Even historians working on topics rather than places were locked into the framework of nations. This was and certainly continues to be the case for, the, for historians of fraternalism, including Freemasonry. Scholarship on fraternalism, as well as uh, representations of uh, fraternalism in public history and popular culture, are clearly focused on, the, on discrete national contexts. Now, Buckner's call to pay attention to the broader dimensions of Canadian history coincided with a movement within the history profession that challenged the, domi the na domination of the nation state as the central unit of historical analysis. And for expediency's sake today, I'll refer to that movement as world history. But know that world history has many different forms, uh, transnational history, international history, the new imperial history, Atlantic history, it takes many different forms, and that there is a lot of intense debate within the field. Uh, and also, of course, uh, world history as a methodology or way of doing history was not new in the 1990s. But it did gain a lot of momentum and start having a major impact on the broader profession about that time. Now, world history is not the history of everything, but rather the history of global interconnectedness. How peoples, locales, nations, and regions became entangled with each other over time. To practice world history is to pursue scholarship with a global perspective. The best world history explores the connections between the local and the global with keen attention to both contexts. Another way of practicing world history involves studying the worlds that people have made, the worlds they have imagined and created, broadly conceived spheres of interest, activity, and identity, such as the British world, or the Masonic world, or the Islamic world. And it is precisely this approach, I argue, that the history of fraternalism generally, and the history of Freemasonry specifically, demand. Now let me be clear. I am not suggesting that we discard the nation state as a unit of historical analysis. We have gained tremendous insight from works written in this vein, using Freemasonry, for example, to examine uh, the changing ideals of early American society, the work of Steve Bullock, or the intellectual and political networks of 18th century Russia, the work of Doug Smith. But the nation-centered approach, when overemphasized, causes us to miss crucial dimensions of fraternal activity, as well as a fundamental aspect of fraternalism, namely the sense of belonging to, the wor to a world that extends well beyond the nation state. This afternoon, I hope to demonstrate that by adopting the assumptions and approaches of world history pays great dividends for the study of fraternalism, of Freemasonry, and of Canada itself. My argument briefly stated is that we can only understand the complexities of fraternal history when we use multiple and intersecting units and scales of analysis, localities, nations, empires, and worlds. I will be presenting a bird's eye view, but along the way I'll be drawing most of my evidence from the Masonic history of Upper Canada slash Ontario and Canada to demonstrate some of the ways fraternal organizations operate at the intersection of the local and the global. So the talk is divided in three parts. You can see them briefly here. 
I'll start with globalization, but I'm going to take a quick sip, please. Excuse me. Globalization is a buzzword of our era. It is frequently bandied about on the radio, on television, and of course on the web. But few take the time to define what they actually mean by globalization. So let me give you my working definition distilled from my reading on the topic. Globalization is the process by which the world has become increasingly interrelated and interconnected over, over time. It's connectivity on a global scale. Now, a lot of people have very strong opinions about globalization. Some argue that it's a good thing. Advocates of free trade, for example, see globalization as a positive progressive force, generating employment and ultimately raising standards of living worldwide. Others argue that globalization is a bad thing. They see it as a means of expropriating the resources of poor countries, of causing environmental degradation, of exploiting labor. While people can have very different opinions about whether globalization is a positive or a negative development, most of us can agree that it is a reality of our contemporary world. It's hard to deny the fact that something is happening to make it seem like the world is continuously shrinking. Air travel, cell phones, internet, social networking, all of these technologies are connecting people in ways previously unimagined. So you think about the current events in the Middle East and how they were holding up signs in support of what was going on in Wisconsin. I mean, that's, a, that's an interconnection that, that, that's, that's remarkable. So this seems unimagined uh, in the past. In fact, we, we, we think of globalization as a phenomenon of our times, that we are experiencing something unprecedented, that it is a recent and fairly drastic development. But globalization is not a new thing. It has a history. The extraordinary interconnectivity that we are experiencing today represents the elaboration of processes and movements, trade, expanding religion, empire building, all sorts of processes and movements that have been at work for hundreds of years. And I will argue Freemasonry has something to do with that history. Most scholars and commentators who work on globalization focus on economics. They investigate global exchanges of capital, commodities, and labor, or they talk about demographic flows, or disease transmission, or technology. Few have taken into consideration the cultural and intellectual history of globalization. And just uh, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with this term, intellectual history, I mean, there, there is stupid history, but uh, intellectual history is uh, actually the history of ideas. So the idea of the world, uh, the idea of interconnectivity. Historian Tony Ballantyne has pointed out, quote, on the few occasions it has entered the historical literature on empire, globalization has been interpreted in a narrowly economistic fashion. The cultural aspects of imperial globalization remain largely unexplored. But as you will see, Freemasonry, a socio-cultural institution par excellence, has made a significant multifaceted contribution to globalization. The first way that Freemasonry contributed to global, globalizing the world was by achieving global extensity. In other words, it gained a simultaneous presence in many different parts of the world. Spreading worldwide during the 18th century, Freemasonry was one of the very first cultural institutions to operate on a global scale. In the process, it brought together men from all over the world, not just Europeans, but the others that they were encountering. How did it do this in an era before the development of modern transport and communication systems, before Facebook? <laughs> well, from very early on, Speculative Freemasonry was organized and administered as a network, and this is important. A network is an interconnected system, an interrelated group of people who share interests and concerns and interact for mutual assistance. In the case of Freemasonry, the most basic unit of the network is the local lodge. Individual lodges of speculative Freemasons began appearing in the British Isles during the early modern period. Uh, for those of you who are Masonic scholars, you'll, you'll notice that in that phrase I totally avoided the origins debate. Uh, in the British Isles during the early modern period, that's, that's where I'm going to leave it. But then in the 18th century, in the early 18th century, some lodges began coming together to form grand lodges. These became the network's central hubs. Eventually, coordinated regional nodes or provincial grand lodges also emerged, and I'll have more on those in a minute. Well, what do networks do? 
They bring people into contact and association with one another. Brothers getting to know brothers, lodges interacting with lodges, grand lodges communicating with other lodges and with each other. It's a very powerful means of association. I think all of the Masons here today know exactly what I mean. How many of you have met someone through Freemasonry who you would have not otherwise met, right? And, and, and who needs Facebook after all or LinkedIn? Uh, you know, Freemasonry is the ultimate social networking tool, right? So during the middle decades of the 18th century, the development of this nascent Masonic network and the activities of these Grand Lodges turned speculative Freemasonry into a readily identifiable institution with standardized practices, policies, and procedures. And these were outlined for the first time in Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons. And I, I want to point out that the Sankey Collection actually has uh, um, um, multiple versions of uh, not only Anderson's constitutions, but other constitutions as they were uh, published in Canada. And they're, they're a really wonderful uh, historical source. So this, this part of institutionalization was very important. When a new lodge emerged, it became part of an ever-growing network that contemporaries readily recognized as Masonic. And basically, British Freemasonry was undergoing institutionalization in this period. It emerged as a discrete public institution with a centralized administration. Another reason for Freemasonry's success in spreading around the world was the fact that its metropolitan administration proved quite adaptable and responsive to opportunities for growth. Uh, when I say metropolitan, I'm just referring to the British Isles as opposed to out there in the empire. So uh, historians of empire use the term metropole too. It, it's like the, the new term for the mother, mother country, okay? Uh, so the metropolitan administration was very adaptable and responsive uh, and, and took advantage and developed mechanisms uh, that enabled the network to proliferate. Uh, one of the first things that happened was that the Grand Lodges uh, uh, developed certificates of membership. As the Brotherhood grew in popularity, it became vulnerable to imposters. To address this problem, the Grand Lodge of Ireland began issuing certificates to individual brethren. Now, the Grand Lodge of Ireland was actually the most innovative and the most responsive. It had been the first Grand Lodge to issue actual paper warrants to its lodges. Uh, and uh, the Grand Lodge of England and the Grand Lodge of Scotland actually followed the Irish lead in these practices. And I know the Irish uh, uh, among you will be very, very proud of that fact. Um, but anyway, a stranger could prove his membership in the Brotherhood by pr producing a certificate and demonstrating his knowledge of Masonic passwords and hand grips and rituals. So here I have uh, the certificate of William Foreman uh, from 1761, issued by the Grand Lodge of Ireland. And uh, I'll just read you from the middle of it, where it, it, it introduces Brother uh, Foreman and says that he may legally be admitted into any assembly of Masons wherever held or congregated. So he would carry this with him uh, by way of introduction. Now this is coming from a little later, uh, 1815, uh, Wallington certificate. Uh, but I love this one. Uh, let me again read from the, the middle down here. Uh, Wallington is being uh, recommended to all men enlight enlightened wheresoever spread on the face of the globe. And I find this uh, particular certificate very interesting because it's, uh, it's uh, half uh, in English and then half in French. Uh, and so you can imagine, uh, 1815, uh, it would be very useful if you happen to find yourself in French territory uh, to have a, a, a certificate that, that, uh, that, that would be understandable. These certificates functioned as passports, passports in the Masonic world. And they were deemed very important for brethren traveling from one part of the empire to another. So Lodge number 241 in Lower Canada granted six certificates in November of 1790 to quote brethren who were on the point of leaving for England. Now by far the most important administrative mechanism that allowed Freemasonry to spread worldwide was the military lodge. So uh, this is actually uh, the warrant for the very first traveling lodge. Uh, I mean, I've got two slides. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a facsimile and then this is a much clearer version so that you can take a look at it. Basically this warrant gave members of the, of the lodge the authority to meet anywhere in the world where they were stationed. Thus the term traveling or ambulatory lodge. Here again we see the Irish taking the lead in developing mechanisms to facilitate Freemasonry's global diffusion. <coughs> 
Not only that, but the Irish Grand Lodge also issued more traveling warrants than any other Grand Lodge. And you can get a sense of this from this table. Nearly every regiment in the British Army eventually had at least one lodge in its ranks. Many had several lodges. Uh, the Royal Artillery is, is the extreme example, but just so that you can get the point, had 28 Masonic lodges. The estimate for the total number of lodges uh, is around 500. As Irish Masonic historian Chetward Crawley put it, quote, these lodges permeated everywhere. Everywhere they left behind the germs of Freemasonry. <laughs> no, germs in a good sense. <laughs> really. <laughs> the seedlings of Freemasonry. Okay. And indeed they did. These traveling lodges not only allowed Freemasons to meet anywhere in the world, they also literally planted Freemasonry abroad. When a regiment departed, a garrison town or a colony, civilians who had been invited to participate in the military lodge would continue working and eventually receive their own warrant. Of course, as many of you know, military lodges were instrumental in establishing the Brotherhood in British North America. In Halifax in the late 1740s, in Quebec and Montreal in the period of the Seven Years' War, and later in Upper Canada. Famous military lodges like the Minden Lodge in the 20th Regiment of Foot or the Lodge of Social and Military Virtues in the 46th Regiment were active in Canada and exposed civilians to Freemasonry. And of course, the 8th or King's Regiment of Foot was stationed in this region uh, between 1773 and 1785, and its lodge uh, held the first recorded lodge meeting on the peninsula. The third administrative mechanism that helped Freemasonry spread ab abroad, in addition to these uh, traveling warrants and certificates uh, was the provincial Grand Lodge system. Uh, this is a map with a chronology imposed on it, and these are just the founding dates of English provincial Grand Lodges. There would have also been Irish and Scottish provincial Grand Lodges, and you can see how it sort of starts in North America and the Caribbean and then gradually comes around the world. Grand Lodges established provincial Grand Lodges wherever a strong Masonic presence had emerged or wherever they anticipated Freemasonry might take root. The provincial Grand Master served as the Grand Master's representative in a locality. Uh, and it's much like the governor's system, right? So the governor was supposed to represent the monarch abroad. Uh, it was similar to that. The Grand Lodge, provincial Grand Lodge and provincial Grand Master had the authority to warrant new lodges. Often, the office was held by a colony's most prominent citizen, such as the, gov of, uh, the governors of Nova Scotia, Edward Cornwallis, Charles Lawrence, John Wentworth. Or uh, Prince Edward Augustus, this was the, set, the fourth son of George II, uh, he was future <coughs> Duke of Kent and future father of Queen Victoria. And he was provincial Grand Master in Lower Canada. He was responsible for collecting fees and dues, keeping registers, corresponding with the Grand Lodge, and keeping the lodges and the brethren in line. So Prince Edward's warrant actually authorized him, quote, to rectify irregularities and to hear a judge and determine all and singular matters of complaint, controversies, or disputes. Uh, sounds like a fun job, doesn't it? Um, most importantly for Freemasonry's ability to achieve global extensity, the provincial, for, excuse me, the provincial Grand Master had the authority to warrant new lodges. So during his administration, Edward uh, uh, warranted about 10 new lodges in Lower Canada, uh, a little bit later, the Provincial Grand Master of Upper Canada uh, warranted 20 new lodges between 1792 and 1799. Think about that, 20 lodges in this area in the space of seven years. By developing administrative tools such as these, British Freemasonry was in an excellent position to take advantage of and respond to opportunities for growth presented by the expansion of the British Empire during the second half of the 18th century. This was an era of aggressive imperialism, driven forward by commercial expansion, migration, scientific exploration. But perhaps the single most important factor responsible for the growth of the empire, and thus Freemasonry, was international rivalry and warfare. The century witnessed a series of conflicts, a series of European wars that had increasingly become colonial affairs, colonial conflicts. Britain did well in these wars, and as a result, took over many of the colonies of its rivals, France and Spain. 
So here I have basically two timelines uh, superimposed. I have the, uh, the, the uh, institutionalization of Freemasonry, which I described earlier, uh, now along with these global conflicts. So take, for example, the First World War. No, I'm not skipping up to the 20th century, uh, but I'm rather referring to the Seven Years' War because it really was the First World War. It was a colonial struggle between France and Britain in North America that escalated into a major European war. For the first time in history, a war was fought simultaneously across many hemispheric fronts in Europe, Asia, and the Americas, thus the First World War. What's important for our purposes is not the causes of this war or uh, the course of this war, but rather its outcome. After some initial setbacks, the British and their allies were victorious. There were minimal territorial shifts in Europe, but dramatic changes took place overseas as Britain emerged as the dominant naval and colonial power. When they signed the Treaty of Paris, ending the conflict in 1763, the British took over Mallorca in the Mediterranean, four French sugar islands in the Caribbean, almost all of North America, including Canada, Florida, and territories east of the Mississippi, and Senegal in Africa. Within two years after the ending of, uh, official ending of the, of the Seven Years' War, Britain would also succeed in chasing the French out of Bengal and establishing the foundations of a territorial empire in India. So think about all the British regiments moving around the world in this period. And remember that almost all of those regiments had at least one Masonic lodge. Think about all the people on the move, the East India Company servants who were going out to Bengal, Scots-Irish settlers crossing the Atlantic, colonial governors moving from one colony to the next. Along with these soldiers and colonial administrators came several hundred thousand colonists. And thousands among them were Freemasons, and they planted Freemasonry wherever they went. If a mason arrived at a destination and found that there was no lodge, or determined that the existing lodge was uh, uh, too crowded, he could petition for a warrant to set up a new lodge. In the words of one early 19th century member, looking back at this period, the 18th century brethren had constructed, quote, a vast chain extending around the whole globe. Thus, in many ways, Freemasonry and the British Empire grew up together. Freemasonry underwent institutionalization and developed mechanisms that facilitated its diffusion as the British Empire underwent phases of massive growth. It was being, via this expanding empire that Freemasonry achieved global extensity. To quote Ballantyne again, while many lands remained beyond British commercial influence or military power, by the 1780s, British commercial factories, naval bases, and missionary stations encircled the world. To that list, we must add Masonic lodges. In addition to achieving global extensity, Freemasonry also contributed to the processes of globalization by fostering global awareness among its members. But before I talk about how Freemasons did this, just a few words on the broader context again. Awareness of the world and all its diversity was a key preoccupation of the Enlightenment, the period of European history that historians date from the end of the 1600s through the French Revolution. Now, while we can trace Freemasonry's origins to an earlier period, it was really during the Enlightenment that Masonry, as we know it today, came into being and flourished. Now, historians used to describe the Enlightenment as an intellectual movement of prominent philosophers like Voltaire and Diderot and Rousseau, who developed and championed core ideas, reason, liberty, anti-clericalism, progress. More recently, historians have begun to talk about the Enlightenment as a cultural movement involving not only these great thinkers, but also an engaged public composed of women as well as men, who gathered in coffee houses and Masonic lodges and we have the work of Dr. Uh, Margaret Jacob to thank for much of this uh, new research. They read everything that they could get their hands on. Uh, they consumed a steady diet of travel literature. And they eagerly absorbed explorers' accounts that told of extraordinary geographical discoveries. So the first edition of the third Cook voyage, the narrative of his third uh, voyage in 1776, sold out in three days. In the process, they developed a much fuller and increasingly theorized picture of the world 
and human variety. Now, Freemasonry gave its members a way to think about the world as it came into focus for 18th century Europeans. And it did so by promoting what I call an ideology of cosmopolitan brotherhood. And by ideology, all I mean is a system of ideas that inform the way people conceptualize the world and their place in it. Freemasonry's ideology was, I am arguing, a globalizing ideology. And it had several intersecting components. So I'm going to go through some of these briefly, and I'll provide some examples from 18th century texts. First, Freemasonry urged its members to practice toleration and inclusiveness, thus the ban on discussing religion and politics in the Lodge. As English Freemasons explained to King George III in the turbulent 1790s, their rules forbade religious and political discussions because, quote, they sharpened the mind of man against his brother. Their brotherhood was composed, quote, of men of various nations professing different rights of faith and attached to opposite systems of government. And so they, they assured the king they were diligently observing uh, the, the rule to, quote, keep quar quarrels about religion or nations or state policy outside the lodge. And so during the 18th century, we actually have evidence of British lodges being relatively inclusive. Men of various religious, social, and political backgrounds sought and won admission into the Brotherhood. And in my book, I, I, I have a chapter exploring how 18th century Freemasonry included in its ranks not only Protestants, but Catholics, Jews, and even some Muslims. Lodges were dominated by white Europeans, to be sure, but occasionally one finds Asians and Africans undergoing initiation and Freemasonry is being celebrated for that very fact. Joseph Brandt, an Iroquois leader and ally of the British, uh, again, uh, well known to, to people in this region, was initiated into Freemasonry in London in 1776. That same year, across the world in southern India, a Muslim prince, the future Nawab of Arcot, became a Mason. Addressing the prince, the Grand Lodge of England observed, quote, the good moral man of every country or denomination is qualified to participate in Masonry. Even some among the growing numbers of free blacks in North America were admitted to the Brotherhood. This was the moment when Prince Hall and several of, of, of his uh, fellow prominent African Americans in Boston were initiated by an Irish regimental lodge and subsequently recognized by the Grand Lodge of England as a legitimate lodge. And by subsequently, I mean like within a, within a year or two. Freemasonry's inclusiveness extended beyond religion and race to politics as well. 18th century lodges included men from across the political spectrum, from conservative, conservative loyalists like the men in charge of the British Grand Lodges to hot-headed uh, radicals like French Jacobins and United Irishmen who rebelled against the British in 1798. Freemasons were instructed to be tolerant because all mankind belonged to the institution claimed to a universal family, as they described it, the common fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. And this is the second aspect of Masonic ideology that fostered global awareness. Like many in the Enlightenment, Freemasons believed in the fundamental unity of mankind, or monogenesis. Though, of course, they accepted the idea uh, that the family of mankind was inherently hierarchical. The family is not necessarily an institution of, of equals. All of you who have older siblings know that, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm the youngest of, uh, in my family, so I know about that. Uh, one Masonic, although I think my brother and sister would definitely say that I'm the more favored child because I'm the youngest, but anyway, the point is families are, they can be one, they can be a, a, a unit, uh, all, you know, all, all from the same origin, but uh, uh, not necessarily uh, all equals. One Masonic handbook from the 1798 reminded its readers, we are taught to regard the whole human species as one family, the high, low, rich, and poor, all created by one almighty being, and sent into the world for the aid, support, and protection of each other, one family. On this grand principle, masonry unites men of every country, sect, and opinion. Freemasonry's claim to unite men of every country, sect, and opinion was frequently uttered. It would also be in the 19th century frequently put to the test. <coughs> so with an open mind and with an awareness that he was always among his brothers, the Mason was expected to feel at home in any part of the world. He was a cosmopolite. That's the 18th century term for a citizen of the world. 
William Preston, whose illustrations of Freemasonry became a bestseller in England during the 18th century. This book just keeps going into new editions. In fact, the most recent edition is an electronic edition. I, I wonder what Preston would think about that. Um, in, this, uh, in this important work, he explained that Masonry, quote, unites men of the most opposite religions of the most distant countries and of the most contradictory opinions in one indissoluble bond of unfeigned affection. As a result of this fraternalism, Preston went on, in every nation a Mason may find a friend, in every climate he may find a home. The final component of Freemasonry's cosmopolitan fraternalism was the command to express love and practice benevolence. According to 18th century Masonic texts, like the, one I, the ones that I've been quoting, the Mason, the Mason should express love for his brethren and indeed for mankind in general. Brotherly love was a favorite topic of 18th century Masonic sermons. Most pamphlets and tracts, and there were a lot of these published during the 18th and 19th century, and a lot of them in the Sankey collection, also either touched on or alluded, alluded to the theme of brotherly love. So, the dissertation, a, a dissertation on Freemasonry explained, united by the endearing name of brother, Freemasons live in an affection and friendship rarely to be met with even among those whom the ties of blood ought to bind together in the firmest manner. So not only are they our, their family, but they're even better than, than an actual family. Uh, this, this comes from much later, 1899, but it's just such an amazing shot of a lodge in, uh, in uh, southern Africa, and you can see brotherly love, relief, and it would say truth uh, if they had just moved the camera over a little. Can't be too picky, I'm so pleased to have these kinds of images. Practicing brotherly love meant acting charitably, not only towards members of the brotherhood, but also toward the wider community, and I'll have more on that in a minute. So these four strands of cosmopolitan brotherhood constituted an ideology that I am describing of as fraternal cosmopolitanism. Uh, we might also describe it as global fraternalism. And in fact, it was fraternalism that was really the key to all of this, the key to Freemasonry's extensity, the key to its ideology, and as I'll demonstrate next, the key to the functioning of its network. <coughs> Members viewed one another as brethren, connected by shared ritual experiences and pledges of mutual obligation. But before I get to the network, a uh, very important caveat. Freemasonry's ideology of cosmopolitan fraternalism was marked by limitations and tensions. And this is one of the major arguments that I make in the book and many scholars of Freemasonry have made. While some others did find their way into Freemasonry, European men do dominated lodge memberships. Lodges could blackball a candidate they deemed unfit for whatever reason. In fact, this cosmopolitanism that I've been describing for the end of the 18th century began to recede in the early decades of the 19th century. I don't have time to discuss this fully, but it's just important to point out that British Freemasonry became increasingly exclusive, limiting membership to white, Protestant, middle and upper class men who were unquestionably loyal to the state. As the 19th century proceeded, excluded groups, blacks, Hindus, and Parsis, even women, would begin calling on Freemasonry to live up to its claims to universal brotherhood. And this is a story, again, that, that plays out uh, over the 19th century, and I, I don't have time to go into it today. What's important for our purposes right now, and the argument about globalization, is that despite these limitations and tensions, from the outset, Masonic ideology did encourage members to think beyond the local and the national to the global and to embrace others as their brothers. So, Freemasonry helped make the world a more interconnected and interdependent place by achieving a global presence and by promoting an ideology of cosmopolitan brotherhood. The brotherhood also contributed to globalization by enabling men to network on a global scale. And here, Freemasonry is truly without precedent and ultimately becomes a model for dozens of other institutions seeking to do this sort of thing. The fraternal bonds forged in the Lodge translated into many forms of mutual assistance that benefited men of low means or the highest ranking elites and everybody in between. A good standing member's access to services was limited only by the extent of the network and as we've seen by the uh, end of the 18th century, that network was indeed global. Once a man established his credentials as a legitimate Freemason, he could call on this network 
to fulfill wide-ranging needs. And these needs were particularly acute for men working and living in Britain's far-flung empire. Merchants, soldiers, sailors, surgeons, explorers, settlers, colonial officials. <coughs> Having left his kinship networks behind in Europe, a colonist found in Freemasonry an institution that met many of his needs. Lodge meetings were opportunities for fellowship, growth, and recreation. Stationed in Nova Scotia in 1758, Captain John Knox observed that the activities of his lodge helped relieve the boredom of garrison duty, quote, when the time passes very heavily. Membership benefited brothers who had fallen onto hard times. During the War of American Independence, the Grand Lodge of England collected 100 pounds to help distressed brethren in Nova Scotia. In the next decade, the Provincial Grand Lodge of Nova Scotia, retur Nova Scotia returned the favor by providing for the needs, quote, of traveling brethren from England, Scotland, and Ireland, driven to distress by diverse misfortunes in this distant part of His Majesty's dominions, far from their native homes. Meanwhile, three lodges in Montreal established a permanent char charity fund and actually purchased a house, quote, for the relief of necessitous brethren. So it helps those in need. Being a Mason, excuse me, also made it easier to travel around the world and to adjust to strange environment and to become upwardly mobile. Charles Stewart, returning to England in 1793 after serving as interim governor of Bengal, was accompanied by a letter from the Provincial Grand Lodge of Bengal, recommending him to the English Grand Master, quote, as a very worthy and benevolent man and as a faithful and zealous Mason. Think about this, this is a governor coming back to the British Isles with a letter from the Masons vouching for him. Securing a recommendation letter from one's Masonic brothers was a common practice for 18th century men on the move. I came across a lot of these in my research. Not surprisingly, Freemasonry developed a reputation for being very useful to men uh, on their way out to the colonies. So writing to the English Grand Lodge, a police magistrate uh, in New South Wales noticed that most of the free colonists had been admitted as Masons before departing England. Quote, from the prevailing notion of the necessity of being so on becoming travelers. So if you were going to if you were going to travel, uh, then you should become a Mason. In all the settlement colonies of Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and of course Canada, joining a lodge could help confer respectability on rising men, ease their transition into middle and, uh, and elite circles, and give them access to powerful social and political networks. Now it's important, very important I think, to point out that the Masonic network functioned not only to the benefit of individual brethren like the ones I've been discussing, but also to the wider community. And in the process it contributed to the building of the empire itself. Indeed, Freemasonry became a prominent and recognizable feature of the imperial landscape. Its lodges served as community centers, its entertainments were the highlights of the social calendar, and its ceremonies and processions contributed to the display of British power overseas. There's no question that during the 18th century and the 19th century, Freemasonry was a pub public institution. The examples are endless. Plays put on by regimental lodges stationed in the West Indies, Masonic balls held in India and Cape Town, procession <coughs> and foundation stone laying ceremonies in every corner of the empire. I have a list three pages long, single spaced, of all the processions and ceremonies uh, uh, conducted by Masons uh, that I came across in the course of my research. But Upper Canada actually perhaps provides the best example of how Freemasonry benefited colonial communities. In 1791, the Niagara Land Board met to determine the site and layout for the town of Niagara. Now, the settlement uh, had, uh, had been occurring in the environs of the fort since 1780, uh, but in 1791, they were getting serious about building the town. So, the government re recommended to the land board the building of a marketplace, a church, and a school. Sounds good, right? What do you think the first thing was that they built? Actually, a public house, all right? <laughs> then a Masonic. And then what would be third? A jail. <laughs> forget the school, forget the church, and the marketplace was just everywhere, so. Freemasons Hall quickly became the center of community life in Niagara. It had two stories. The first was accessible to the public, the second only to Masons. 
It was the site of community dances, meetings of the Agricultural Society of Upper Canada, and Anglican services for 17 years. It took a long time to get that church built. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor John Simcoe, a long-standing Freemason himself, readily made use of Freemasons Hall for official government functions. It housed the legislature and functioned as both a courthouse and an Indian council house. In so doing, Simcoe endorsed Freemasonry's status as a key colonial institution. And this was further evidenced by the fact that the colony's most prominent citizens were active members of the lodge. Freemasonry also benefited the broader community when Freemasons extended their charity to non-Masons. This happened with regularity. In the 1760s, the inhabitants of Quebec City faced both wartime deprivations from that First World War uh, and horrible winters. The lodges responded by extending, quote, their charitable collections not only to distressed brethren and poor window, window, widows of brethren who have fallen on the fields of battle, but even to relieve the distresses and miseries of some hundreds of poor, miserable Canadians during the course of a long and severe winter. So they're talking about former French subjects uh, who are now part of the empire, the British Empire. And they also mention uh, extending uh, aid to poor widows of brethren. And indeed, widows and orphans of Freemasons received special attention all over the empire. But again, sticking close to home here, by the, uh, the mid-1790s, Upper Canadian Freemasons were earmarking funds, quote, uh, for the benefit of Freemasons' widows, the education of orphans, and indigent brethren's children. So, by fulfilling a variety of needs ranging from convivial association to easing man's transition from one society to another, belonging to the fraternity made life easier for the men who governed, defended, and lived in the empire. Now, before I fed, head into the final section of my lecture, just let me summarize what I've been saying so far. Freemasonry made a multifaceted contribution to the history of globalization, of making the world a more interconnected place. It was one of the first cultural institution to its institutions to extend its reach across the world. It promoted this ideology of cosmopolitan brotherhood that taught members a particular way of thinking about this world. And it facilitated social mobility and global movement. In the process, Freemasonry helped lubricate several other agents of globalization, including trading networks, migration flows, and empires. And it did all this in the days before telegraphs and passports, and even steamships. Now all of these, oh, okay, let me go back for a second here. Not ready for that one yet. Telegraphs, pa passports, and steamships would help usher in a new phase in the history of globalization during the second half of the 19th century. Combined with industrialization, the spread of global capitalism, the expansion of European empires, and mass migration, they intensified the processes of globalization and gave globalization its modern form. As it had in the 18th century, Freemasonry adapted to these conditions and took advantage of these new circumstances. Even more than before, Freemasons made their presence felt in nearly every corner of the world. The lodges, the number of lodges and provincial land lodges just kept, kept multiplying. They built permanent lodge buildings. They marched in public processions. They reported their meetings in newspapers, not just Masonic uh, publications, but regular newspapers. And they published tracts for members and non-members alike. Their interconnectivity extended and intensified during the, 18th, the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, the, the industrialized modern world, as Grand Lodges began exchanging correspondence and representatives, and Masonic periodicals began circulating news and discussions about the world of Masonry. In these and other venues, Freemasons continued to promote an ideology of cosmopolitan fraternalism, which I've just been describing. The, the themes remain consistent from the 18th century through the 19th century, stressing openness, global brotherhood, global citizenship, and benevolence. So like their 18th century predecessors, 19th century Free Freemasons saw themselves as citizens of the world and members of a global brotherhood. At the same time, they were subjects of the world's most powerful empire by this point, and members of, of a fraternal organization that contributed in significant ways to that empire's well-being. 
Canadian Masons of the 19th and early 20th centuries saw themselves as benefiting from and contributing to Britain's great empire. And this is evident both in the lives of individual brethren and in the activities of lodges and grand lodges. So I'll just go through some of the ways that, uh, that, uh, that Canadian Masons saw themselves as imperial citizens uh, as, I, as I finish up here today. So for many men in the early decades of Victoria's reign, the colonies were a zone of economic and social opportunity. Membership in masonry helped them take full advantage of the opportunities the empire presented. We see this clearly in the case of Upper Canada, uh, not only with the pioneer generation, uh, but uh, also with the emigrants of the 1830s and beyond. The population influx from the British Isles was significant. In 1814, the population of, of Upper Canada was about 90,000. Between 1815 and 1850, 800,000 more British migrants arrived in the colony, and they're part of this 22.6 million uh, who are coming out of the British Isles into all parts of the world. But there's a big pop population influx into Upper Canada at this point. This created fertile ground for the growth of Freemasonry. And indeed, in spite of the challenges that the Brotherhood faced in Upper Canada in this period, there are a lot of problems in the Masonic administration of the, of the 20s and 30s, schisms and uh, uh, problems with the Jarvis administration. Uh, then you have the fallout from the Morgan affair. So there's a lot of trouble, but in spite of all of that, the overall trend was one of growth in the number of lodges and members. <coughs> As it had in Niagara in the early days, Masonry played a central role in the lives of early Canadian communities offering a safety net for members who fell onto hard times, more processions, uh, more uh, ways to encourage self-improvement, fellowship, and conviviality. And membership in the Brotherhood proved especially attractive to men of humble origins who were seeking to achieve prominence, men who were upwardly mobile. <coughs> One example here, James Fitzgibbon, who was born into modest circumstances in County Limerick in Ireland, he arrived in Canada in 1802 as an NCO in the 49th Regiment. Actually initiated uh, not in a regimental lodge, but in Merchant's Lodge in Quebec. And joining the Masons was but one of many steps that Fitz Fitzgibbon undertook to improve himself and improve his station. Uh, so he took lessons in manners and lessons in handwriting, and joining the Masons was part of this <coughs> self-improvement program. He did well. He rose steadily through the ranks of the militia, the colonial administration, and Freemasonry itself. In fact, he became the Kingston Convention's nomination for the office of Provincial Grand Master. Now, though Fitzgibbon had become a uh, very well-connected and enthusiastic Mason, he did not receive uh, the nomination. Rather, uh, the Grand Lodge of England appointed Simon McGillivray as Provincial Grand Master of Upper Canada in 1822. And I think these two men uh, beautifully represent the fact that this is definitely a British empire, right? That you have Scots and Irish in addition to the English uh, coming into the empire. Simon was the nephew of Simon McTavish, founder of the Northwest Company, and one of the wealthiest men in Montreal at the end of the 18th century. Simon and his brother William, there are other, another brother as well, but the, the two of them uh, spent their careers in the family business. They were also very active in Freemasonry. Uh, eventually named partners in the company. In 1810, Simon became the company's chief agent in London, where he was uh, initiated into Freemasonry and became very well connected to the Grand Lodge of England. And he knew the Grand Master, in fact. He embodied the transatlantic connections linking the British Isles and British North America. Between 1813 and 1825, he took 16 trips across the Atlantic. During his 1821 trip to Canada, to negotiate a merger with the, the rival Hudson Bay Company. It was uh, during this trip that the Grand Lodge from England dispatched him, quote, to do such acts as may appear best calculated to promote the welfare of the fraternity, to, to heal all this turmoil that had been going on. And he did, he was successful. He was able to heal the schism. Uh, he, 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 he helped transform Freemasonry in Upper Canada into a very respectable institution identified with the colony's elites. By the mid-1840s, Upper Canadian Freemasonry was thriving, and the stage was set for a long-term association between the Brotherhood and colonial elites, including some of the most prominent British Canadians of the second half of the 18th century. And here is your Grand Lodge of Canada in 1875. 
in the province of Ontario. <laughs> Wherever one went in the settlement colonies of the mid-19th century empire, one would find Freemasons among both the colonial elites and the legions of men seeking entrance into elite circles. Joining lodges helped a man acquire status and respectability. Masonry thus played an important role in broadening the middle and elite classes governing the British Empire at mid-century. By helping to ensure their success, it contributed directly to the success and power of the empire itself. Now, the connection between the Brotherhood and the empire intensified over the course of the century. In fact, in 1900, the Canadian Craftsman, which was a, a Masonic periodical, commented on this fact and said to its readers, did it ever occur to the brethren that in building up the British Empire to its present grand position in the world, that the very leaders of the various achievements that have made it such a mighty force in the settling of the affairs of nations were members of the craft? Indeed, Freemasons of the Victorian era thought of themselves as imperial citizens par excellence. And we see this profound sense of imperial citizenship in Freemasons' preoccupation with the royal family. As Masons, they felt they had a special claim to and shared identity with the Hanoverians. Canadian Freemasons could boast of a direct relationship with the royal family extending all the way back to the time of Edward, Duke of Kent, who I talked about earlier. Here he is a little bit older. The Duke enthusiastically encouraged Freemasonry wherever his military career took him, and it took him all over the world during his, uh, during his life. He was very active in Freemasonry while serving as commander-in-chief uh, commander of Nova Scotia, where local Masons expressed their, quote, firm adherence to that excellent form of government which is the peculiar blessing of a British subject. Right? So they are British subjects, and Edward is at their head. <coughs> In 1800, Edward, alongside Governor Wentworth, took a leading role in a foundation stone laying ceremony to, uh, to uh, uh, build uh, Halifax's first Masonic Hall. So he, he embodied this connection. Now his grandson, uh, Arthur, Duke of Connaught, also embodied the convergence of royalty, empire, and Freemasonry. He was the third son of Victorian Albert, also a, a dedicated army officer, an imperial proconsul, and Freemason. And like his grandfather, went all over the empire. He described Freemasonry, quote, as a public service which has done so much to maintain our empire. This is the kind of quotes you come across as a historian. You're like, yes! <laughs> the Duke had a, uh, a close relationship with Canada. Having served there during the Feeney invasion and the Red River Rebellion in 1869-1870, Arthur went on to hold commands in Egypt, India, Ireland, the Mediterranean, and of course Canada. He came back. Uh, and when he visited Toronto in 1890, he met with 700 of his closest Masonic brethren, uh, who proclaimed, of the ties which bind us to the mother country, none are stronger than the bond which unites us to our brethren in masonry in Great Britain. 19th century Freemasons in Canada also proclaimed their Britishness by ardently professing their loyalty to the Queen. As one Canadian Masonic periodical explained, we as Freemasons have been taught to revere our sovereign. So it was Canadian lodges that took the lead in celebrating the jubilees of Victoria's reign. Now Victoria was not a Mason, right? Uh, but she was officially patroness of, the, of English Freemasonry and was recognized as such. The Grand Lodge of Canada attributed the prosperity of Freemasonry to, quote, the liberty and toleration that have been so much fostered during the reign of our glorious sovereign, end quote. And if Freemasonry's, excuse me, if Victoria's reign had, had fostered Freemasonry, then the Brotherhood had strengthened her empire. One Canadian brother commented that Freemasons had, quote, proved themselves to be the very bulwark of her throne. The empire, he continued, has been welded together and is being more tightly welded together by men who have been reared and trained amongst, amidst Masonic influences. Another way that Canadian Freemasons identified with and learned about the empire was via the Masonic periodical press. Now, there had been some Masonic publications, uh, 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 quarterly publications and such during the 18th century, but this press just takes off in the modern world. Again, another, another uh, uh, hallmark of the modern period. In fact, fostering imperial awareness was a chief aim of the craftsmen, launched, quote, 
to promote the great interests of British America as an integral part of the British Empire by uniting, uniting Masons in every part of it more strongly in the bonds of brotherly love, relief, and truth. Every issue of the Craftsman carried news about imperial events. I mean, they were, they were tracking Livingston around, uh, around Africa. They were talking about Fenian invasions, uh, the latest news from India and beyond. And they loved, loved to highlight the accomplishments of famous Freemasons like Lord Kitchener and Lord Roberts. The Craftsman, uh, <coughs> oh, so there's a reverence for Victoria and uh, the Golden Jubilee uh, celebration in Royal Albert, Albert Hall in London in 1887. So this is the rival of the Craftsman, the Masonic Sun. Celebrated the advent of the Imperial Ocean Penny Posted serv so Service in 1899, so you could send a letter uh, for a penny. The first letter, in fact, sent via the service was a Masonic greeting from Canadian Freemasons to the English Grand Lodge. And it stated that this new penny posted system, like Freemasonry, would strengthen the kindly feelings we have for England. The Masonic network, just as it had in the 18th century, facilitated people's movements around the ever-growing empire of the late 19th century. One, Victor, uh, one, one brother, Victor Dumas, who was a veterinarian, had moved to Madras, hoping to take advantage of opportunities there to set up a new practice. It didn't work out for him. His business failed, and he ran out of money. And he got to turn to the District Grand Lodge of Madras, who provided his passage to Singapore and, and uh, extra funds for, quote, his immediate wants upon arrival. On the other side of the ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean, Masons in Cape Town helped stranded brethren find their way home and offered other forms of assistance. Here in Canada, the Freemasons were instrumental in assisting migration from the British Isles. So Masons in British Columbia collaborated with the Royal Masonic Institution for Girls, essentially an orphanage, uh, to bring young girls to the West. And this was just one of many assisted migration schemes involving Canadian Freemasons during the late 19th century. Movement coming in this direction. But at the same time, Canadian Freemasons visiting or residing in the British Isles could also take advantage of the network. They could visit the Empire Lodge, for example, founded in 1885 to strengthen, quote, the bonds that unite the dominions with the mother country by bringing the brethren from overseas into close relationship with Freemasons in the metropolis of our empire. The whole point of this lodge was to bring together men from different parts of the empire. There are many of these empire lodges. The Anglo-Colonial Lodge was, was established about this time, and its motto was hands across the sea. Of special interest and significance was Canada Lodge in London, founded in 1911. Its founders expressed the confidence that the Lodge would, quote, assist in the great work of forming those bonds of indissoluble attachment. They like that word indissoluble. It comes up a lot. It's hard to say, actually. Uh, which shall ever unite the component parts of the British Empire. Okay. The Lodge played a role uh, also in this empire migration movement that I've been describing and uh, in welcoming Canadian soldiers during the Great War. And this brings me to the final way that Freemasonry fostered a sense of membership in the world's greatest empire, by cementing relations between Britain and the Dominions, especially in times of war. The impulse came from both directions, from the Metropole and from the Dominions. The British Grand Lodges, as well as the Empire Lodges like the ones I've just mentioned, celebrated and encouraged Freemasonry's ability to help make the empire a source of strength for Britain. And this is a point, end of the 19th century, where Britain, uh, though still the most powerful empire in the world, was facing a lot of competition from Germany, from the United States, from other powers. So that impulse comes from the metropolitan side. For their part, Canadian Freemasons cherished the imperial connection and willingly rallied to the empire in times of need. Canadian Grand Lodges went to great lengths to promote service to the empire. They encouraged enlistment in the armed forces and sang the praises of Canada's sons who, re who took up arms in defense of the empire. They assisted and honored returning soldiers. And in sermons, speeches, publications, and ceremonies, they drummed up imperial sentiment. Their members answered the call. Coming to the empire's defense during the Sudan campaign of 1885, so you have Canadian Freemasons fighting in Sudan for the empire in 1885, during the Boer War, or Anglo-South African War, as it's now called, and of course during the First World War. 
1899, in the height of the Boer War, a prominent Ontario Mason proclaimed, we have dispatched over 2,000 of our gallant sons to that dark continent, where, if grim necessity demands, they are willing to cement the bond of imperial unity with their life's blood. Responses to the Great War also demonstrated the pervasiveness of imperialist sentiment among Canadian Freemasons. And they continued to pro proclaim that Masonry played a unique role of, uh, in cementing the empire during times of crisis. So the initial, uh, initial Canadian expeditionary force of 32,000 volunteers included over 6,000 Masons. And once again, the, uh, the Grand Lodges go on a, a, a sort of coordinate a multifaceted program to assist Britain uh, uh, by supporting soldiers and their families and raising a lot of money for the war effort. I'll just quickly conclude. In 1915, the Master of Empire Lodge, the one I just talked about, the one in London, told a gathering of members and 160 visiting Canadian soldiers that, quote, you all belong to two brotherhoods, those of masonry and those of the empire. This comment gets to the heart of what I've been saying today. The members of Empire Lodge and their visiting brethren belong to a fraternity that had since the 18th century created a vast chain around the world and met their wide-ranging needs. At the same time, they belong to an empire that claimed their loyalty and affections. Their global fraternal and imperial identities were mutually reinforcing and reciprocal. And then as the nation of Canada emerged during the second half of the 19th century, their identities took on yet another dimension, that of being Canadians. But once again, it was not in conflict with the wider communities, imperial and Masonic, in which they claimed membership. In white dominions like Canada, imperial and national were complementary rather than oppositional identities. Indeed, the history of Freemasonry in Canada reveals the fundamental relationship between imperialist and national identity. Acting on the former, your imperial identity proved the latter, your, your identity as a, as a Canadian. I have tons of examples of this, this, this rhetoric in which uh, they consistently claim that Canada's hard-won status as a nation did not entail separation from the empire, but maturity within it. So two years into the war, the Grand Master of Canada proclaimed, quote, this, it's two years into the First World War, Today, Canada stands before the world as a young and vigorous daughter in the imperial family. Canadian nationhood had been realized within and through the empire, not in opposition to it. These complex interactions of global, fraternal, imperial, and national can only be appreciated when we study Freemasonry with attention to multiple intersecting contexts. As I hope I've demonstrated today, when we adopt the methods of world history to examine fraternalism, the payoffs are significant. Doing so allows us to see Freemasonry's multifaceted contribution to the history of globalization, as well as the profoundly important role the Brotherhood played in the history of the British Empire. For how can we hope to fully understand a global Brotherhood such as Freemasonry if we ourselves fail to adopt global perspectives? To understand the significance of Freemasonry, we must uh, approach its history as historian Peter Coclanus has urged with great scholarly cosmopolitanism. <laughs>